So it is my pleasure today to introduce Professor Eric Heller from Harvard. Uh, Eric got his bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota and then went to Harvard for his PhD in chemical physics. So after um, his PhD, he actually came to the University of Chicago as a postdoc, and uh, he worked with Stuart Rice. Many of you may know Stuart because he was heavily involved in the beam lines uh, for the University of Chicago here at the APS many years ago. After his stint at the uh, University of Chicago, he was on the faculty of UCLA, spent some time at Los Alamos, University of Washington, and then in 1993 came back to his his alma mater uh, at Harvard uh, to begin uh, work there in the chemistry and physics departments. Now, he's been recognized for a variety of different things. I'm not going to give a laundry list of all the things, but uh, one thing I did want to point out, he was awarded in 2005 the American Chemical Society Award for Theoretical Chemistry. Um, Eric is also a fellow of the American Physical Society, so you can see he, he truly is uh, involved in both physics and chemistry. And sort of an aside, uh, not directly related to his presentation today, he has a book, the Why You Hear What You Hear. And uh, associated with that book, there's a website, which I spent an hour playing with this morning because it's got all these cool kind of things. And so if you're interested in acoustics, uh, I, I would recommend the website. I haven't read the book, but the website is really fun to, to play around with. So at this point, no coffee yet, but uh, I would like to introduce Eric Heller. Thank you very much, and I did mean it. Uh, I expect to see every one of you get up sooner or later when the coffee arrives. And. Uh, uh, believe me, I would um, if I were out there, and I might even if I'm here. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. It's been a long time since I've been here. It is my second visit, I think. Um, but the last one must have been over, well over 30 years ago. And um, I've had a wonderful day. I expect to have a bit more after this. And I'm incredibly impressed with the... Uh, the excitement here and the, the range of science being done here. Um, you know, I get excited by big physics facilities, but you know, this is better because it isn't just all about the Higgs boson or something like that. There's so much different science going on here. Um, so this is the title of the talk and a bit of a outline and uh, some of the people who contribute to what I'll be um, discussing, and the people, especially the DOE now, who are supporting it, uh, the NSF uh, more in the past. Uh, I want to begin with some examples, which I hope will partly entertain you, on examples of branch flow in nature, and what is branch flow. And I'll start with the thing that got me into it. In fact, um, in this particular field, nobody was into it until Bob Westervelt, through his experiments, brought us into it. It's a bit odd that that didn't happen spontaneously, um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say why in a, in a second. But the uh, essence of so many Nobel Prizes is these LGAS uh, semiconductor 2D electron gases um, with a donor layer and uh, electron gas layer at the interface, gates that you can place, and in Bob's case, a movable gate, uh, which he used to image electrons coming through a quantum point contact. His idea was, along with Mark Topinka, was that uh, if I send, if I have electrons flowing through a quantum point contact, and here you, you actually have a fairly good rendition of a reflectionless mode, which, which exists if the contact is smooth enough that goes all the way through without reflecting back. Uh, but anyway, if the uh, scanning probe microscope negatively charged were placed somewhere and, and it was in the, in the line of fire, so to speak, it could scatter electrons back through the, through the quantum point contact 
and it would become an indicator of the existence of the electrons. In other words, you could map the pattern of flow of the electrons through the device, because you certainly can't scatter an electron back toward where you came if, you, if there isn't an electron there in the first place. But without a magnetic field present, I mean, later there were magnetic fields present, but I won't be talking about that today. Um, without a magnetic field present, you simply uh, can presumably time reverse and go back through the way you came. And uh, so this became a way to detect the electron flow. And uh, the experiment, one of the first that he got, he and Mike, uh, Mark, looked like this. And Bob was depressed. And if you have him out to speak someday, he, he would say that. He said, his apparatus is obviously broken. And uh, I didn't know what to expect. He, he didn't tell me he was even doing this stuff. But uh, he said, well, we have a quantum point contact here. It's sending out a uniform spray. We have a random potential over here. Uh, these are caused by the uh, local uh, lumps and bumps uh, due to ch uh, charged donor atoms in the ceiling, so to speak, in the layer above. OK, uh, advisor, who do, what caused that? Well, that wasn't my cell phone. It's in a different pocket. Where are you? Did you leave the room? <laughs> OK, let's hope it doesn't happen again. I'll put my cell phone over here just in case. <laughs> um, so the, uh, all the bad news about this that Bob felt, uh, well, you know, I started to say, with this random potential, which isn't shown here, uh, the bumps are you know, about that big, and they're all over the place. But they aren't big enough to backscatter. So you're riding over the top of these bumps. Maybe they're only 10% of your energy at the Fermi energy. Um, random potential, plus it was already a, a sort of a random spray when it came out. Why would it bunch up like this? So he thought his apparatus was broken. But instead of that disappointment, there are three gorgeous uh, pieces of luck and discovery here. One of them is the branches are real, and I'll show you why in a second, and they should be there. Another one is that the quantum interference fringes are present long beyond when they were expected to be present in terms of distance from the source, because the finite temperature, four degrees or so, of the experiment made the round trip from, let's say, here, where there are still fringes, back again, uh, the phase difference between the colder and the hotter electrons near the top of the Fermi C was greater than pi, and so they should have been disappeared. But this was actually due to coherent backscattering from uh, small impurities, which are also in here, uh, competing against the backscattering and the phase of the electron from the tip. This is an image, a scan of the uh, conductance as a function of tip position. And so the other thing is, the tip is about that big. I think maybe I have a picture of it. And uh, the raster scan is done like this. And as you, uh, you know, you're using STM technology, and as you raster scan, you pick up data. And uh, why would the uh, Resolution in this experiment be so much better than the size of the blunt instrument you're using. And the answer to that is another, another piece of luck. Ah, here comes the coffee. Um, if you're an electron traveling along here and you hit to the side, you're not going back. Only if you hit a little narrow zone right there are you going to be able to head back the way you came. So it's actually a very small probe. Not, a big, not nearly as big as it looks. Bob likes to use the analogy of a Christmas tree bulb in a dark room, and you have a flashlight, not a laser, because that would be cheating, but just a broad beam. And what would you see uh, if you had the flashlight aimed more or less at the Christmas tree bulb? You wouldn't see the whole bulb all lit up. 
because the room is dark. You'd see just this glint coming back at you, and that's why these experiments have such great resolution. So what about the uh, branching? Well, I looked into that in the next few days, and it didn't take me long to get a picture like that. So I checked the literature for, you know, what is the typical uh, height of the bumps, how many impurities are there, and I ran trajectories at the Fermi energy. And uh, what came out of here was a uniform spray, and it soon made these branches. So uh, this is an absolutely ubiquitous phenomenon in nature, and uh, it makes nice pictures. We tricked Nature magazine into using it on the cover because we sent them a picture that looked something like green ooze that came from the bottom of the ocean and they fell for it and put it on the, the cover. Back then, nature was, was almost all about biology. Uh, that was before nature physics and so on. And then physics today liked it, but uh, let's go back to the origins here and what is, what is this branching? And it really begins with the very mundane, not mundane, but very well-known cusp, uh, cusp catastrophe as Michael Berry would call it, or the optics of a bad lens, where the focal point, even for a plane wave coming in, is not uh, at one spot, but over a range of axial uh, position. Um, and there's a focal point in the data. Uh, it's actually, you can see the curved wave, wave fronts and then kind of goes here, and these are actually two caustics that are heading out. I'll show you those in a second. Um, so let's talk about this cusp catastrophe. Uh, here we have a bunch of uh, parallel waves coming in, representing the ray tracing for a plane wave, of course, whose wave fronts are vertical here. Uh, but we're doing the ray tracing, and here's our bad lens. And once you get in there, you start to bend uh, toward the center. Uh, let's say there's a differential density in here. But once you leave the lens, you're, you're back on uh, whatever new direction you're, you're sent in, and you're going on a straight line. But this is the appearance of the cusp from such a, a bad lens. And we're going to call this direction y, and this is x. And we want to now look in phase space, or uh, plotting PY or velocity Y versus Y. So velocity along the red screen there and uh, position along it as well. That's called a surface of section. And uh, it starts out being really boring because everybody, by definition, got sent in along a long range of Y, but with the same momentum. Actually, the momentum component zero along Y. But then after the, the lens starts to act, uh, we have uh, the same range of y, but now we start to go up or down along y, depending upon whether we're below and heading up or above and heading down. In other words, there's an undulation in, in uh, by versus y. And then shortly thereafter, let's say you've gone beyond, and this is what happened to you in the lens, now, these trajectories, so to speak, they have additional uh, momentum uh, in the positive direction, and they're going to go that way. In the middle, it's going to stay put. That's a ray through the middle, which has not been changed in its direction. That's this ray. And then down here, they're going to go in the negative direction and move backwards relative to this. And so this manifold of trajectories is going to fold over by the time you get to this blue region, uh, you get these accumulation zones, and that's because this is phase space, but coordinate space, which we're looking at here, is a projection of phase space. We're integrating over all Vy and looking at Y, and we notice there's a big pile up right along here where a lot of different uh, trajectories all have the same value of Y, 
Uh, they have slightly different values of V sub y, but they pile up right below and right below there, and those are those two caustic, cusp catastrophes, they're called. But that's just a single cusp, and uh, we have to be a little careful about the picture I just drew, uh, and that is, it's better to use either a dot density along these lines rather than a single width line, or else give the line some thickness to begin with. And if you do that, uh, you can do something which we call kick and drift to simulate this. The kick is the momentum boost in one uh, to the plus or to the minus that you get as you enter the lens. I just showed you that. Uh, and that happens first, just like acceleration of a particle at rest on a hill. Momentum changes first, then position. And uh, here we have the momentum uh, undulating because we got uh, uh, kicks up or down in different places along the manifold and X. And then uh, if we, oh, sorry, that, that might be the potential in red that would have caused that. Uh, transitory kick, which the uh, manifold here got, but this has thickness. You see it there in the black. And now, if you let it just drift, the faster particles go to the right, the slower ones to the left. But notice that the thickness is, is changing. Sorry for that. The thickness has changed. It's thinner along zones like this and getting thicker here and here. That means there are even though we have Liouville's theorem and the, the amount of black, the density of this zone is the same as it started, uh, there's just more of it that accumulated here than, 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 let's say, here. And now when I do a, a projection down to coordinate space, I'm going to have two effects, not only the fact that a whole bunch of the manifold lies vertically, but that there's many more trajectories, if you will, that make up this black zone that are also in approximately the same position. And if I keep going with another independent kick uh, and then a period of drift, this is, might be a picture of what you get. And you see, this, uh, this is why you don't want to use lines of constant thickness, because it would uh, not allow you to, to know how important it is these hairpin turning points are really collecting a lot of trajectories. This is all Leoville's theorem obeying stuff. It's just that some parts are thinning out and other parts are getting thicker. Uh, and it's very important to what you see in coordinate space to know this. Um, so if you want to draw pictures like that of manifold evolution, um, this instead is what you should draw. Uh, the red line is what you might have drawn before, and you see a lot of that in other literature and other fields, uh, but uh, although it's correct qualitatively, it doesn't have the information about these uh, rather significant accumulation regions. And when you project this black region down into coordinate space, you get the blue picture here. And uh, for example, here is a, a big bump in probability of finding the trajectory in coordinate space at that position, and it's not even lying vertically relative to this uh, vertical projection. It's not what we call a caustic. It's just a big bump, and we need to know about it. So uh, that's uh, something which uh, uh, I wanted to tell you, and I'll give you an even more extreme example in a second. Uh, it, this is related to the patterns that you see in the bottom pool bottoms in, in, in the sun, uh, and uh, so if you like, that's one example of this kind of branch flow. Here's another one, which is um, uh, re refractive uh, scattering in the interstellar medium. Uh, let me move on to other examples. The SOFAR channel, uh, this is a waveguide in the ocean about a kilometer down, uh, which the whales use to communicate because uh, waves actually start in the channel and stay in the channel. Uh, I keep hitting the wrong button here. So uh, if you launch a wave in the channel, it tends to stay in the channel. And uh, 
but there's this branching that starts to form. Uh, and if you're a whale, you can go thousands of kilometers and communicate to the next whale because your energy dissipation is so much less than if it was spreading out in three dimensions. Uh, the sound, the issue of sound propagation in the ocean, independent of the SOFAR channel, just because of thermal and density variations due to the salt content and so on, uh, was investigated by Steve Tomsevic. And uh, here is uh, a couple of uh, rather uh, short plots, but still you begin to see the same effect of the branching of uh, electron, uh, sorry, uh, audio wave flow in water and how very nonlinear and how uh, branchy it's going to become. He was also interested in stable regions that he found. I may get a chance to mention those again. Uh, this is the 2011 tsunami, a, a map of the energy density coming out of that tragedy, uh, including, by the way, a spur that went all the way to the coast of the U.S. and killed somebody who was dumb enough to sit out there in a sandbar and wait for it to arrive, and it washed him away. Uh, but the tsunami wave is huge uh, in wavelength, miles, miles from crest to crest, much greater than the ocean depth, and so the ocean wave, the tsunami waves are traveling in the shallow water limit the whole time. The ocean bottom depth varies with position. That causes refraction. You have a random refraction, and you're, getting, you're beginning to see that random small angle scattering is what's at the heart of this, and uh, so you got this branch flow pattern in the tsunami uh, of 2011. I decided one day, uh, because of this book I was writing on acoustics, to sit outside my home and, uh, and listen to airplanes. We've all heard it. You know, the airplane's up in the sky, and you hear this And it's not because the pilot's drunk and doing this. It's because there's a steady sound coming from the airplane, but the uh, motion of the air, pockets of uh, warmer and colder air, all these things refract sound, and where you're, where you're standing, you're sitting in a pattern of uh, caustics, and you're getting louder and softer sound. All wavelengths and frequencies travel at the same speed, so at my home, uh, I got this sound trace. Notice that when it got loud, it got loud at all frequencies. Uh, here's loud again, here's loud again. Uh, there's a Doppler, there's the jet that was causing it. That's the whine of the engine uh, as the jet receded from, from me. Uh, and this is the refraction of the atmosphere, uh, these vertical streaks. I was surprised to see these streaks, but I, and I can't resist mentioning them to you. Uh, it's caused by repetition pitch. So I was sitting in my window, and I was getting the sound from the jet in two ways, primarily. One was directly to my window. One was a bounce off my back lawn, and the two had a different time delay, and that time delay caused certain uh, for a notch filter. And the frequencies of the notch filter changed with time because the geometry changed as the plane moved. So you can see that happening here. In fact, if you stand, anytime you go to the airport, uh, you may hear a jet going overhead. It sounds like some pitch is going up as after they've passed overhead, like maybe the pilot is gunning it. But actually, that pitch is going up because of repetition pitch. The path length difference is becoming less between directly from the plane and one bounce off the asphalt in the parking lot, and that means a shorter time delay, higher pitch, and that'll happen every time as you stand in a, a near an airport and the plane goes overhead. All right, so uh, the examples go on and on. Here's the interstellar medium. Uh, apparently, if you put an antenna out and just collect uh, microwave radiation, you get uh, variations in um, intensity that vary over the scale of hours. 
and this is presumably caused by uh, electron-rich or charged clouds uh, in our galaxy, microwaves pass through, and there's a scintillation issue, and basically uh, a branch flow issue with regions of higher and lower microwave density passing by your observation point. I don't know whether the, the caustics are moving faster or the Earth is moving through the caustics or what the relative issue is there, but you're certainly not sitting there statically at one point in this field. And that's why the microwave radiation intensity changes. Um, in collaboration with us, uh, uh, Hans Jürgen Stuckmann has looked at this branch flow and uh, freak waves, actually. I'll tell you about them in a little while later. Uh, for a random potential and microwaves traveling through the random potential. And he saw very strong freak wave uh, oscillations, uh, very strong events happening spontaneously in his apparatus as he changed the frequency uh, and watched the time evolution of his of, of uh, microwaves in this uh, microwave cavity, which was about uh, a meter and a half by a meter and a half. Um, so this is the book. And uh, I want to mention one more thing. This is just, uh, actually, this will require sound. Will it work? Um, the sound is plugged in, but it, I'm not hearing. There we go. That's as loud as it gets. I hope it works. So just for. For fun, I wanted to tell you about two more effects. These are earthquakes and sound making it to the, or pulses of, of compressional energy making it to the surface. Uh, they are by now, by, by a few people know quite well, I certainly wasn't the first to realize it, that um, these uh, basically sonic boom-like sounds, which are heard in several places in the country and around the world, the Finger Lakes region is one of them. It sounds like a cannon went off or a sonic or a plane flew over supersonically. And they were known to James Fenimore Cooper. In 1850, he wrote about them and debunked all the theories that had been put forward at that time. Uh, but what is happening is that there's a shallow earthquake. And although high frequency deformations, short deformations are attenuated rapidly, if the earthquake fault is close enough to the surface, uh, the uh, surface will deform, not the particles on the surface won't um, move faster than the speed of sound. In fact, they won't move more than a, a few meters per second. But the wave that created, that they're, that's being created by the arrival of this pulse is traveling way faster than the speed of sound. And you get a boom. It's like a loudspeaker that's, that's sort of recreating the sound of a sonic boom. Uh, there was never anything moving supersonically, but you hear a, a sonic boom. Um, and uh, this is well established. I mean, Modus, Connecticut is another place where this happens and is happening this, uh, these days. Uh, but what if uh, that wave travels through three-dimensional rock and it arrives after being focused and branched? This is an arrival uh, sort of uh, pear-shaped uh, zone of higher energy density, which cuts off quickly. That's a few meters across from a simulation I did. And then I want you to watch this uh, video. Um, here's the focusing going on in rock of varying density with, a, with an earthquake source uh, not too far from the surface. But the events of the last few days have changed that. They have attracted scientists from all over the country and stump them all. How can a big chunk of Earth just get up and move away? The mystery barely unraveled by Leslie Donovan. From the air, you can see what scientists call a phenomenon. Somehow a large chunk of Earth was plucked from the ground and dropped down some 70 feet away. Uh, two waves coming together. Oh, right. Where they meet, you get an amplification of, uh, of the waves. Geologist Greg Behrens has never seen anything like this. He says not humans nor machines could have moved a chunk of Earth this huge without leaving a trace. 
you know, at first I was, I was rather skeptical, wondering if, if someone had come up here and was trying to pull a hoax. Uh, being in such a remote area like this, uh, the likelihood of it being discovered would be uh, almost nil to start with. And then looking around the area and seeing that, uh, that there isn't any indication that man had done it, uh, it's, it's real intriguing. Scientists figure the chunk weighs about three tons and perfectly matches the hole like a puzzle piece. The piece fits, but little else matches up. In the pit, the roots are intact. That means the chunk was torn from the ground or ejected. That can sometimes occur during an earthquake. In October, there was a mild earthquake centered 20 miles from the hole. But an earth ejection this huge would have to come from a major shaker. Nothing like that has been reported here. Well, I think you get it. Uh, I'm claiming that's an example of branched flow and uh, a large energy density branch uh, reached the surface. Uh, I wish one of these geologists would find out. I think there's hard rock just beneath that soil. And uh, there's a sudden and violent acceleration in a small spot and it ejects the, uh, the uh, seven, three tons of soil. The biggest example of this goes back to the 1400s and it was a 25 foot long wide, a 50 foot long strip of soil that just got moved. Uh, and uh, as crazy as you think I am for thinking it is that, uh, what then do you think it is? At, at the end of this uh, uh, TV article, only a few more seconds, she, said, she mentions alien. But that, that's, that's about all that you can come up with. Um, all right, so I want to talk about this uh, issue of phase space compression. Uh, it's really rather interesting. Uh, if you wanted to think about some phase space evolution that took that shape in, in phase space into this one, and you were in the habit of drawing thin lines, you'd be done, you'd go home. But if instead you made it look, give it some thickness, then after you're done, actually, you find that there's been a tremendous cooling of the particles. They had lots of energy because they're out here in phase space. And most of them, not all of them, uh, wound up very cool. And actually, this is perfectly legal in terms of Leoville's theorem because this area inside here is the same as it was before. And uh, Chris Jarzinski gave me this movie he made. I love it because it shows the same thing happening in a time-dependent potential and the ability to do this kind of thing uh, dynamically. Let's watch it. He starts out with a bunch of, this is phase space, a bunch of particles that are more or less the same energy, have quite a bit of energy and a quartic potential. He's going to lower one side, collect a bunch over here, raise it again. And now there's a few telltale particles. These are the particles that are part of what should be a continuous string of them if we had enough of them that maintain Leibovitz's theorem but we succeeded in cooling most, most of the particles. Uh, all right, so let's, let's go beyond this one lens sort of uh, cusp catastrophe business and talk about many lenses, a drawer full of bad lenses. So imagine you come uh, again with these plane waves and you come to, to a place where you're going to get a kick. You've just drifted, you're going to get a kick. And that kick is random, and it gives you all sorts of new little directions. And in plot and phase space, it looks like this. And uh, for those of you who like Photoshop, these pictures were done in Photoshop, and you can do this in five minutes in Photoshop because there is a tool to do vertical random shear uh, and, and a continuous a, a, a simple horizontal shear, which I'm going to do next here. There's the horizontal shear of this, and that corresponds to the drifting. And then there's another totally independent random set of kicks, and that gives you this pattern, and drift, and kick and drift. And interestingly, when you're done, uh, here again goes right back to that example with electrons in the semiconductor. You expected 
Maybe it would stay uniform, but after the kicking and drifting of a perfectly already sprayed out uniform distribution, you look and you've got streaks. This is the, this is the density of particles in coordinate space projected downward from this phase space picture. And you have these uh, branches that would be branches if we were following them along a distance. Uh, this kind of thing, and this sort of thing, if you look in more closely. And some of these branches are really quite strong. And those are the idea of the stable branches, which I mentioned Steve Tomsevich had run into. And uh, we'll see if we have time for that. Uh, one nice way of looking at this is to just fill phase space, get photos, fire up Photoshop, make this picture with circles and stripes. And the circles are nice little indicators of the local stability and direction of the stretching, if there is any, anywhere you care to look in phase space after a few iterations. And these stripes tell you about a manifold of points, uh, much as we've been drawing. And so after the first kick and drift, another one. Now you begin to see already some places are getting very strongly stretched, while others uh, are getting lucky and not much is happening to them. And blobs are forming, which uh, lots of density seems to be piling up in. And stretching is very severe in other places. So uh, the issue of density down here in coordinate space is uh, if you wanted to plot the red density, for example, it'd be large under here, even though there's no caustic. So it's, it's very important to understand this, this uh, process. We call this uh, rarefaction. And it's got to do with the stability matrix elements I'm not gonna, of the dynamics. I'm not going to drag you through that. But um, it's something that we hope to be uh, publishing soon. Um, and about the survival of these things, there, this is lucky or unlucky, whichever you prefer to exist in the, in the presence of all these random bumps. Eventually, this is going to meet some random set of bumps and just dissipate, become stretched out. So these, these things are, are responsible for the thick branches that you saw in that green picture. Uh, Eventually, if you wait long enough in time or distance, these thick branches will disappear, will dissipate. And you'll get much more uniform uh, trajectory density far from the source. If you have light that you're using, it'll become more uniform and less streak. Uh, another way to do it, I, I alluded to this, is rather than use thickness to the lines, just use a, a constant dot density. And then uh, if you evolve the dots as dots, you'll see parts of the lines have still extremely high dot density, while other parts of the line have been stretched, have very few dots relative to these parts. And that matters a lot when you project onto coordinate space and want to know what's the coordinate space distribution, you know, anything but uniform. Um, so uh, this, this actually resulted in an interesting exchange in nature physics uh, between a group at Stanford and us. Uh, they were claiming, uh, this is Mike Jura's group, the same Mike DePinko had worked with uh, Bob Westervelt, that there were unexpected features of branch flow going through high mobility two-dimensional electron gases. In other words, they were changing the quantum point contact, making it different, but repeatedly seeing the same branch in the flow after they changed it. And they said, what's the matter here? Everybody knows that these uh, flows through a random potential are unstable. They're chaotic. Uh, typically, you get uh, exponential uh, sensitivity to initial conditions. And I thought, I told my graduate student, Bo Lu, oh, this must be these strong branches. And he said, no, 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 it's something else. I said, come on, Bo. He said, no, it's something else. And uh, he was right. So uh, it's amazingly simple and a beautiful lesson. And I want to tell you about it now. Um, so again, what's happening is changing the 
uh, initial condition launch uh, so that these, the wave packets passing through these quantum point contacts are barely overlapping and the dynamics is all unstable here and you wind up with the same branches. So they went beyond this and they, um, they looked, uh, they did their own studies, classical and quantum. And they found this extreme sensitivity classically. They used point injections and then they found it matters a lot where you put the point and you, the, the same branches just disappear if you move the point. But quantum mechanically, they used something like a quantum point contact in their calculations they found the same quantum stability that they had seen. So that even though the wave packets overlapped barely at all, that they were launching, they saw the same branches strongly appear in both. And they thought this was a quantum interference effect or something, pure quantum effect. And it got published, as you saw, in Nature. Uh, but what Bo realized was, you know, there's a, there's a theorem about wave packets, whatever overlap they have, they've got to maintain it. So if they have almost no overlap, you know, people are thinking, how could it possibly populate the same branch? But he said, you know, Rick, that theorem is if they're propagating in the same Hamiltonian. They moved the Hamiltonian. Those QPCs got moved. So the two things you're looking at propagated under different Hamiltonians. Well, you think, wait a minute, how can it matter? I mean, out here where the bumps are, they're propagating in the same potential. But uh, actually, it matters a lot what happens here. And uh, I can sort of indicate that to you. There's, there's a wave packet confined to coming through that quantum point contact. It's going to encounter all these random potential bumps on the other side. Uh, but, I don't know if you saw that, notice how the quantum point contact got moved over by at least about one wave packet width. Now it's over there, up, it's up there, and there's a different wave packet being launched there, and it's experiencing a different potential uh, in its early life history. And there's no theorem that says they can't develop overlap if they're evolving in different potentials. And uh, indeed, if you had launched them both in uh, the same potential with almost no overlap, no matter what happened, they'd have to have almost no overlap for the rest of time. And so what Jura et al. had done is, and this would apply to light and light sources too, if they had a point light source, or in this case a point injection of electrons, um, and they moved it over and injected again, uh, there's no d real difference in the Hamiltonians there. It, it enters the medium the same way, no difference, both ways, just a point source. And yes, they're propagating in the same medium, so there can be no overlap development. That's why they saw the classical sensitivity for this point injection. It's like holding a laser up to uh, a piece of glass with lots of... Uh, density variations in it, watching the pattern of light go through the, the glass. Um, you should see exponential sensitivity there. But if instead of a laser, you use some kind of adiabatic flashlight that let the light evolve uh, before it reached the glass, and then you move the whole damn thing over and do it again, then they did have a different life before they reach the, in a different Hamiltonian, before they reach the, um, the, the substrate, the glass. It's an incredibly simple and yet incredibly subtle point. We had four back and forth with the referee about pancake syrup and how that would always just mix. If you had, if you poured pancake syrup from two holes, it would obviously in two dimensions just mix. You know, this paper's trivial, he didn't want it. And I said, well, if it's that trivial, how come it got published in Nature Physics, you know, the, the experimental? Anyway, it took us four times, and they finally uh, uh, let it get published in uh, PRL. Uh, so this is my student's, uh, Bo's calculation, and uh, he actually did the 
uh, calculation from those two different QPCs. And then he looked in phase space later and found that um, this is with the random potential present, by the way. They look like this when they were born. And they're overlapping like 90% later in time. Uh, and there they are, actually, den a density plot. You can see the similarity in where they are in phase space. So uh, they go from 10% to 85% overlap in phase space because of the adiabatic quantum point contact that they're traveling through. That's different in case A and B. Um, so what I wanted to show you here, uh, so there's, there's some of the R calculations showing of the survival of the branches for rather different launch, launching, uh, as long as they were launched through a quantum point contact and the initial dynamics was different. Uh, now I wanted to show you a movie with uh, these trajectories being launched on a surface uh, like this stage, only there's random potential bumps. It's like mo rolling marbles across the stage, but somebody had sanded bumps into it that were smooth and randomly placed. And you're going to launch marbles, the first one at this angle, then you change the angle by a tenth of a degree, and launch the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and see where they go. And you'll see them sequentially in this movie. That's not the right movie. Go look at it. Notice how they're being launched at higher and higher angle, and forming these branches. This is just a, a Fortran code that's writing its uh, pixels to the screen. So it's that simple. And there's so many, uh, one of the reasons this is not as well known as it should be is that so many discussions stop about there, where you get the first uh, caustics. Twinkling starlight is actually like this. It's, uh, you're not really deep in the refractive regime when you see stars twinkle. You're not, you're not way out here. You're looking at the first caustics. Um, another uh, question that occurs to us, and I think would, uh, inter would occur if, uh, if you're worried about light propagation um, and you were doing ray tracing, so here's uh, uh, Tobias Kramer's calculation with the random potential shown in the contour map, the classical trajectory is shown as dot density in black, and the quantum flux shown in color, with high flux being yellow and red. And uh, you see this nice uh, agreement in much of the territory here between the two. Um, but you change the you change Planck's constant a little bit, and all of a sudden, the quantum flux takes off and leaves behind a dead branch here in the classical mechanics. So uh, the classical quantum correspondence, the, the ray wave correspondence, in other words, isn't something we understand perfectly well. We think we know a mechanism for this to happen uh, and why it might happen. Uh, we do know that if you average over many Planck's constants, these things tend to go away. This is an anomalous value of Planck's constant. You could also average over the energy of the particle, anything that uh, changes the wavelength. Uh, this is a quantum interference effect, we believe, that's causing that to happen. Uh, it's a very strange system, because if you have a sudden quantum interference effect causing, let's say, a wave function in a bowl to bunch up somewhere because the of of quantum interference and the wave packet gets confined compared to what the classical trajectories are doing, then that wave packet is soon going to dissipate and become dissipated all over the bowl again. But here, what happens if that ever happens, if I meet a new bump in the potential, 
I could make permanent what has happened temporarily, because I'm going to kick right or left. And if I miss that kick, I'm not going back. So it's an interesting system. But that qualitative explanation, I don't think I can um, uh, expect you to believe, or even me to believe, necessarily. Oh, there it is happening again. I don't want to show that. Now, uh, ocean wave. This is uh, the movie flyer from The Perfect Storm um, some years back, many years back, uh, about the boat that really did founder and people died off the coast of uh, New England. Uh, I don't think from the stories I've heard and the survivors that that picture of that wave is necessarily an exaggeration for what can happen to you if you see a freak wave in the ocean. And uh, some such things have been recorded uh, by radar and also by recording devices on uh, oil platforms, some really big events, which you wouldn't want to be there if they happen. Uh, and the satellite data actually showed us that about 50 times more freak events were happening on the world's ocean than had been predicted by bad luck Gaussian statistics. So that theory was worked out primarily by Christopher Long and Higgins, who did every imaginable Gaussian statistic you could get for uniform sample Gaussian random wave. So uh, the bottom line on those freak waves is you get very unlucky, all the crests add up, and you get a huge wave. And that happens with a certain probability. Uh, but that was rapidly losing favor. And the people in the field en masse uh, said, well, it must be nonlinear effect. And so everybody was working on nonlinear effect when we were working on what I'm going to show you instead. I don't deny the importance of nonlinear effect. In fact, my collaborator, Lev Kaplan, is very much involved in combining what we know here and what we know are important nonlinear effects, too. But there was an intermediate step which they sort of uh, forgot. Uh, there's one of these walls of water approaching a ship that survived. The trouble is with these walls of water, if the bow or stern gets buried in the wall, it probably crashes on the deck and splits the ship in two. This one uh, survived, but very often these ships would disappear in 10 seconds, and there was no radio um, signal. Maybe one per year would do that, and they didn't know why. It's still happening. Um, so the ultimate cause for this, uh, what's the refracting medium? It's, it's water that's moving, not uniformly. It's got eddies in it, and you have basically a classical mechanics for deep water waves um, with omega of k be sort of taking the role of uh, the Hamiltonian. Frequency is a function of wave vector. And it's very much like sound waves. Um, I guess, in the interest of time, I want to move on. And uh, there's, there's some examples of eddies taking satellite imagery, taking uh, off the coast of Australia in one case, off Japan the other case, showing eddies in the ocean. They're there, and they cause refraction of the waves. And Bent, uh, Thornburg, and Benjamin White were the first non-oceanographers to say, hey, you know what, these could cause freak waves. And they did this calculation, which shows uh, the eddy field in solid and dashed lines, and then incoming plane waves, and the wave energy density that would result. And here you see branched flow. And um, th this, they published this in a, uh, I'm not sure if it was an oceanography journal, but they were roundly criticized because they, you know, they were basically laughed out of the room, very unjustifiably in my opinion, uh, because they, people said, well, everybody knows that in ocean storms, they don't all come from one direction. These caustics, which you say cause freak waves, they're going to get averaged over when I average over direction, and they're going to go away. In fact, that's uh, related to this explanation. I'll show you the, uh, the one about the freak waves in a second. But I love this one. This is uh, explaining why stars twinkle and planets don't. 
This is exactly an issue of averaging over uh, what would have been sharp caustic. Uh, in that case, it's averaging, in this case, it's, it's averaging over the finite angular diameter of a, of a planetary light source as opposed to the essentially zero angular diameter of a stellar light source. And uh, this would reinforce the fact that you can tell which are planets and which are stars by which ones twinkle would reinforce the oceanographer's arguments against Benton Hornberg. Uh, so, uh, but this was BBC, and they said, rather than being points of light, planets are small disks. That's good. As their light is more spread out, even if some of it is absorbed, uh-oh, absorbed by our atmosphere, some of the light still filters through so the planet doesn't twinkle. This means that you can tell the difference between a star and a planet without even needing a telescope just by seeing if it twinkles. Well, this just goes really bad right here because starlight's also absorbed by the atmosphere. <laughs> Doesn't explain anything. So I call this example of BB sci BBC science gone bad. And um, the correct explanation is extended source damp scintillation. Infinities or caustics in the wave field become somewhat smoothed out by the finite size of the planetary disk, and they don't cause as much twinkling in your eye. But the analog in a rogue wave theory was an oceanographer criticizing the Fornberg paper, said, well, look, here's a caustic, all right, but when I average over different caustics, uh, I'm going to wipe out, here's the caustic, but if I move it a little, move the source a little bit, there's the caustic, and there's the same caustic, and it's just going to go away. And he said he had done calculations like this, and he actually didn't do any calculations for this paper. Uh, uh, this is an example of visual proof gone bad. It's actually not true. So let's see what, is, what does happen to these caustics. Um, but as the question is being raised is, Focal point caustics, they're destroyed by averaging over different incident wave directions. Um, it's like uh, Norman here. If he's trying to do evil things with magnifying glasses on a cloudy day, it isn't going to work. He needs a point source. And cloudy days, like averaging over wave uh, set directions, would wipe out the effect, wouldn't it? Um, and this is the Gaussian statistics of Long and Higgins that I mentioned, even if the uh, day is completely cloudy, at least I have Gaussian statistics and the possibility of a freak wave, all, di all directions equally populated. Um, and uh, I guess in the interest of time, I'm going to show you what happens. This is one of our Photoshop pictures using not just one value of momentum, but a range of momenta, like uh, you have when uh, a range of waves coming in incoherently from different directions. And after one uh, kick episode and drift episode, you already see that there still are regions of low density and high density in the uh, wave energy density. And if you keep going, actually that doesn't really smooth out. It gets sharper, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this is the same smooth Gaussian distribution in this direction propagated over five or ten iterations, and you see big variations in energy density and sharp features. If you look in coordinate space at this, you see the same sorts of things. Um, these caustics have been smoothed out because we've averaged over a direction, but these sharp features um, come in at later times and later distances, and they really intrigue me because Mariner's report of the three kinds of freak waves they report, one kind is uh, the, uh, s the small, sharp wave coming from the wrong direction. That the storm is going this way, and if you were a ship sitting here, you're getting a, a wave coming in at 45 degrees. And these, these things form spontaneously, um, even with, uh, uh, without any nonlinear effect. And this is the essence of the difference, the, the missing element that I alluded to earlier about the um, Long and Higgins work 
and what the modification we did to it because of this branch flow. What we, we actually borrowed from Log and Higgins and said, you know, everywhere on the ocean, now, rather than do uniform sampling everywhere, which he did, we said the energy density, because of this branch flow, even though it's been smoothed out, uh, isn't uniform. And suppose we do Long and Higgins uh, not over a uniform energy density, but a variable energy density. And you all know if you're looking for rare events and you have some regions of uh, broader Gaussians, because the high energy density is high, this Gaussian is going to dominate all the other Gaussians, and you're going to get a much higher probability of very rare events from a few regions of high density, energy density. And uh, that's exactly what we see. This is um, uh, at region C, where we're sending in waves that are Gaussian random, and there's no fo focusing yet. They haven't hit the eddies. Um, just to make sure we're, we're doing things uh, correctly in region C, the amount uh, of, uh, that are six sigma out of wave heights from the average wave height is exactly what's predicted by uh, Gaussian statistics. But if you go into region B, the amount of uh, regions that's six sigma out from what it, sh what it should be the, amount, the number of events that are six sigma out in region B from what Gaussians would predict is 663 times uh, this calm region up here. And uh, even in region A, where it turns out we've turned off the random potential, it's still much higher. And these blue regions are five sigma events that we watched in our, sig our simulations, and the red regions are six sigma events. All the blue regions are still freak wave events. And uh, so we actually uh, got a paper published in um, the Journal of Geophysical Research uh, showing that we could explain the factor of 50 uh, just from some reasonable assumptions about, uh, and some things that were known and measured about eddies in the ocean, how long it took uh, caustics to form, which is actually quite a long time. It's 50 kilometers or more between the eddies and the propagating wave and the first caustic to form. Um, so uh, that's the paper in the Journal of Physical, Geophysical Research. And uh, I want to, uh, to say that what, what we've done here is cleared up a, a confusion caused by an experiment with the original uh, Topinka uh, Jura work. Um, we've looked at branching and the ray wave correspondence. We've looked at freak waves. And uh, that's just so I am finishing this faster than I need to quit. I'm sorry I ran over time. So let me get to the right final slide. And uh, Thank you and my collaborators uh, for the opportunity to speak here. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions, if there are any from the audience. In the back. Yeah. So you pointed out that for the formation of freak waves, it's important to consider the refraction in a moving medium like eddies in the ocean and such. And I would expect that for a given coastline, uh, the eddy patterns would always be more or less the same. So there should be regions that encounter, where you would encounter freak waves much more often than others. It's like this picture that you showed of the marble on the stage, and there were these branches that were visited and revisited and revisited. So likewise, if you have a certain eddy pattern in the ocean, then you should get certain regions where you've always uh, be getting uh, eddy, uh, freak waves. So um, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with some weird sound effect in which I'm getting your voice delayed by 0.15 seconds.
Well, that's absolutely true. The worst place is the Agulhas Current uh, off the coast of South Africa. Uh, that current causes, that's more or less uh, like the Fornberg scenario because that current is like a big lens and downstream of that lens there's a lot of problems with shipping. Um, the same can be said of uh, off the coast of North America um, with the Humboldt current is a huge freak wave area. So there are places which are much more prone to freak waves and there are lots of eddies that spin off that uh, current by the way um, than others. Uh, we don't see them every day because you want, there is certainly, as I said, a nonlinear component to this, but I don't believe that you can start with ripples on the water and uh, all of this uh, uh, eddy formation and branch flow formation and wind up with a freak wave. You have to start with a certain threshold energy density, and then the nonlinear effects can take over when this initiates an event, including steepening of one face of the wave, breaking of the wave, which is so dangerous. Um, so it's not every day that you're going to see uh, freak waves uh, everywhere on the ocean. But there are, to I think answer your question, there are very uh, relatively safe and relatively unsafe regions in the ocean uh, for freak wave forming. Yeah, so it's any wave in any medium. So phonon prop propagation uh, in the presence of the, the essential part of this is um, weak, random scattering. It almost doesn't matter. As long as it's that, there'll be some scale at which these branches will form. Uh, the scale is uh, uh, the scale from branch to branch uh, in a direction perpendicular to the, to the mean flow, that scale is the correlation function length. So if I take a correlation function of the random potential, and I ask, well, what's the, uh, the, there's a bump at zero displacement, of course, and then where's the next bump in the correlation function? That's how far away you expect the next uh, caustic to form. And how far downstream they form is a matter, a relatively simple matter of asking, well, what's the, average momentum deflection and how long would it take two ray paths to meet starting from these two uh, uh, places that are one correlation length apart. And that, those two things happen for thousands of different situations. Uh, you don't have to just use Gaussians as we did and, and make bumps. You can use sharper bumps. You can use uh, less tall bumps, it'll just happen later, and so it's, it's really a universal phenomenon. Uh, just a comment and a question. The comment is, we've seen many times here, if you illuminate a small aperture, an imperfect pinhole, or some small aperture with rough edges, and look at the far field diffraction pattern, uh, using coherent light, x-rays in this case, one sees a pattern that looks very much like these branch flow diagrams you've been showing. So I wonder if that might be the proper explanation with quite sharp, caustic-looking lines. Well, I, I'm not sure I know. I mean, there are sources, uh, both sources of wave energy and also scattering sources that are emitting uh, much, much, much bigger than S-wave. There are many wavelengths across. And if you look far from them, you see these sort of straight-line rays coming out. Those are not the branches we're talking about here. Um, those are quantum interference effects. Um, very often, uh, not always, but very often, they, their analog, the classical analog, wouldn't be there. Um, but the key of them is they're, they're, in the they're in the far field, as you said. They're already traveling in a straight line, and they're like the sun's rays traveling out straight and finally dissipating. These branches, are still curving and crossing each other and doing all sorts of weird things. Uh, they're very distinct from, from that kind of uh, uh, we'll ray motion. We'll have to have another look. I guess that's 
the key distinction. The All question right. I have is, uh, would it be more accurate to say that chaotic or incoherent sources damp scintillations rather than extended sources? In other words, if you had a large extended, highly transversely coherent beam or source, I would think it wouldn't damp scintillations. It would encourage them. Yeah, I think the, uh, the actually coherence doesn't play as large a role as I would wish it did, because I love the coherence. But uh, uh, what it does do is, for example, if I had a completely coherent White and Fornberg kind of plane wave source, then not only do the caustics form freak waves, but they do so every time every wavelength is still there. Then there's another one, there's another one. Uh, and if you just took the White and Fornberg and decohered it, then you get maybe at least you get sometimes a freak wave there, not always. Um, so these, these lumps of higher energy density, they become places where freak waves are more prevalent, more likely to happen, but not going to necessarily happen in the next minute if you're doing a simulation. And uh, uh, that was true of the microwave experiments, too, that uh, were done in Germany. So I think that, um, I mean, that's a very good question. Uh, but basically, this freak wave form, I mean, things are decoherent, but at least there are still wave crests and troughs. They're not decoherent. I mean, locally, there are still those. And, uh, but there aren't any interference effects that are long range left over. For example, if I took the wave field, never mind the eddies, and I put two slits somewhere, and I asked, um, uh, you know, what, what interference would I see? Well, I would see some two-slit interference effects, but it wouldn't be the same uh, purity as if you had a plane wave incident on those two. So you have waves of all different wavelengths, waves of uh, different direction. So the, the, the incident field on this whole story is pretty incoherent. Hello? Oh, there I you think are. I think I'm building off the previous question. So I was intrigued by uh, two words on one of your slides, which was the correspondence between wave picture and ray tracing picture. And I'm wondering if you would comment on that. The, the, the in, correspondence it, between the waves and you had a couple of words where both ray tracing and uh, and uh, wave pictures were there was a correspondence. So you had to. I saw the same words on your slide. Yeah, I mean, this is the ray tracing wave correspondence issue. Right, right. That's my question. Is is when you start with the plane wave, you have you have a wave equation which has a solution, and it seems as you travel forward in your in your in time in your scattering plots, you can discuss more rationally a ray tracing picture. I wonder if you would uh, uh, amplify. Is that a correct? Interpretation. You, you, you have in, in scattering from random medium a transition where a wave equation is the correct way to look at it to where a ray tracing picture is the correct way to look at it. Yeah, um, that initially innocent start actually doesn't really guarantee uh, as much as you would like it to uh, what's going to happen later. And I'm, I'm thinking I can maybe get something going here very quickly, in which I know is I don't have a blackboard. So I'm going to try and uh, create one. I have a USB tablet I've had for a decade. And uh, Well, I don't need this. Sorry. Now it's frozen. Oh, that's 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 a bad sign. There we go. Um, cert. Uh, arrange format. Cert. Well. What I want to draw for you is uh, what you were just saying for a plane wave is saying there is uh, a manifold of trajectories 
uh, with all the same momentum in a wide range of positions. That's that initial condition. And there's another one which uh, is uh, a point source. A point source is actually just as good for demonstrating these issues. Uh, a point source looks like this in phase space. It's quite certain about where it was launched, but it has all different momenta. Now, those momenta don't correspond to different energies. Uh, if I draw in real space, what it means is I got rays going out in all different directions from a point, and indeed, their projection onto an axis varies tremendously from zero to something pretty big, but um, uh, that corresponds to a vertical line in phase space. Whereas if I have a plane wave uh, coming in, everybody's traveling the same direction, and I call this x, and everybody's got zero momentum in that direction along x and very different launch points. But here's my point in the answer to your question. Uh, what happens to manifolds like that is that they start to um, bend and oscillate. And before you know it, before too long, uh, things get really complicated. And this is the classical flow. And if you follow it and plot it, you've got the right classical answer. Quantum mechanically, at best, you can think about the semi-classical answer, which is to take every one of these, if I'm looking here, what's the density right here? Uh, this is, after all, phase space. What's the density here in, in coordinate space? I have to add up all of these branches. Well, I know how to do that classically. But quantum mechanically, I'm supposed to take the square root of each of these contributions, those are amplitudes, add them up with some phase, which I get by doing action integrals, And then it's the sum of all these amplitudes and phases gives me an amplitude which I can square to get the classical probability. So this gives me ample opportunity for the classical probability to start to deviate tremendously from the quantum probability because of the uh, nefarious effects of these interference of these phases. And there's no theorem that says, oh, it has to come back, or on the average it has to be the same I mean, it just can be way off, depending upon these, uh, these phases. So starting out with a plane wave, if I understood you correctly, and propagating in a very straightforward manner through the first caustics, uh, is no guarantee of agreement later, or you can't follow the rays to predict it, because the rays are going to give you this mess, and this mess doesn't, when you realize there's phases involved, doesn't guarantee agreement with the classical mechanics anymore. So I hope that answered your question. Sorry for the length of time it took. Okay, if there are no more questions. Wh one more, one more. So, I, give me the telephone bit again. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, there is this long-standing confusion about uh, what does chaos mean in quantum mechanics when we know it's a linear equation as opposed to the very nonlinear evolution of rays. 
And uh, how can you possibly hope to get the right answer out of these nonlinear rays uh, thinking semi-classically about a linear wave equation? And maybe you shouldn't use them for intuition. Is that part of what you're getting at? Or is, am I off base there? So there's a very fundamental difference between classical and quantum mechanics with respect to response to chaos. Um, that's, that's a given. Does, does that help me here? Was that part of what you're answering, you're asking? Maybe we can do the fishing at the end of the talk here. <laughs> so l let us thank uh, Professor Heller one more time for his talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>